Good afternoon, and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know. You can find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org. I'm Joseph Fink, President Emeritus of Dominican University and past chairman of the Commonwealth Club Board of Governors, and more importantly, I'm your moderator for today's program. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Our speaker today, well, let me, let me mention something else. A few years ago, a friend of mine was asked to introduce uh, Governor Brown's predecessor. And when he did that, he decided to examine the proper protocol for introducing a governor. He discovered that when you introduce a governor or the president of the United States, you don't give any biographical background. You don't say anything about his history. You don't say anything about his uh, experience. You don't say anything about his education. So he stood up and said, ladies and gentlemen, may I present Governor, governor Arnold Schwarzenegger? And the less said, the better. <laughs> now, I'm not going to make that mistake, because the last time I had any substantive time with Governor Brown was when he spoke and was part of a debate against Meg Whitman at the Dominican University campus with Tom Brokaw moderating. And he wiped up the floor with Meg Whitman, stylistically and substantively, and I'd prefer not to have, him, have that happen to me uh, today. <laughs> Instead, I'd like to let you know that I think of Governor Brown as Mr. California. Born in San Francisco, educated in the city, educated at Berkeley, practiced law in LA, was elected Secretary of State in 1970, served two terms as governor in the 70s, was later the, in the late 80s the chairman of the De Democratic Party in the state, in the late 90s he was elected mayor of Oakland, uh, then of, after that elected attorney general, and is now serving his third term as governor. Take all of that, mix it in with a few years in the seminary, a law degree from Yale, studying in Mexico and Japan and China and India, and running for the presidency in 1992, and then add an illustrious father, and you have a Renaissance man who is really Mr. California. Please join me in welcoming the governor of California, who will be speaking to us about Proposition 30, Jerry Brown. Well, thank you very much. And since I'm in San Francisco, I will mention two other items on my resume. In fact, three. I started schooling at the West Portal Grammar School in Forest Hill. I then transferred over to St. Brendan's for the opening class in 1947. And then I went on to St. Ignatius. So there's where I got my foundation. The rest was just filling in the details. <laughs> If you've had the Dominican nuns or the Jesuits in the pre-Vatican era, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so when I did come back uh, as governor 27 years after I left, I promised three things. One, I'd level with the people, tell them the truth. No more smoke and mirrors on the budget. Number two, there would not be any new taxes unless the people themselves voted voted yes on new taxes. And number three, I would strive to re return decision making closer to the cities, the counties, and the local school districts. Believing in the principle of subsidiarity that the institution closest to the problem should have the appropriate responsibility to deal with it. For more than a decade, budgeting in Sacramento relied on gimmicks and accounting maneuvers to deal with a roller coaster of sharply rising and falling tax receipts. Two bubbles. Yes, there were two bubbles. One from the internet boom and the other from promiscuous mortgage expansion. Both of these caused unsustainable spending. And they were followed by the recent Great Recession and a 23% drop in general fund revenue, the biggest since the Depression. When I showed up at the state capitol last year, the deficit 
was $27 billion. $27 billion. On a revenue stream, uh, approximately $90 billion. Now, where are we? Two years later, we've made a lot of tough cuts. We've made decisions. We have a structurally balanced budget. It'll either be balanced for the remainder of the year with cuts to our schools and our colleges, and our community colleges, massive cuts, about $6 billion, or it'll be balanced with money to our schools from Proposition 30. It's that simple. This is a stark choice before the people of California. This is not about electing a human being who may follow through or not with whatever is said prior to the election. This is a decision the people themselves make irrevocably. Once you say yes on Proposition 30, or if you decide to say no, the consequences inexorably follow. Putting the fiscal house in order and getting to the structurally balanced budget has required difficult budget cuts. Difficult budget cuts. 500 million from the court system. I don't know if there are any judges here, or any lawyers. That's real. That's real. That's uh, layoffs, uh, reduced court hours, but we had to make it. A, a, bil uh, a billion dollar cut, 18% from the prison system. 30 to 40,000 fewer inmates housed in our prisons. Prisons are expensive. Wonder why we have so much spending in California. When I left in 1983, we didn't have 23 prisons that were, that were built subsequently. So, and then redevelopment. A lot of good things got built with redevelopment, but it was money that derived from the local property tax that was intended historically for core services, education, uh, police, uh, sheriffs, uh, county, uh, county health. So what happens is that over a period of time, what was going to be a relatively small program to invest in building and economic development became a 12% diversion from the real, ta uh, real property tax. And then the money that wasn't there, that historically would have gone to schools or for local police and sheriffs, the county hospitals, had to be made up from Sacramento. And Sacramento, being on this roller coaster, uh, had to make it up with budget gimmicks, various maneuvers, various pretenses that got us into the mess and resulted in California having the 50 worst credit rating out of our 50 states. But make no mistake about it, there were big cuts, big cuts. Uh, California has reduced 30,000 positions, 50 boards and commissions and other task forces. The corrections department down 18%. Adult day health care cut. Williamson Act uh, subventions that encourage uh, farms to remain in existence that are going to subdivisions cut. The refundable child care and dependent tax credit cut. State grants for low income seniors and persons with disabilities, the halt, the blind, um, the aged, that's back to early 1980 levels. Yeah, we cut them. Their monthly stipend uh, that's been around, you know, for the last 60 years, it's been reduced substantially. Uh, the CalWORKs grants, uh, they're down to where they were in the late 80s. Uh, that's 30 years ago. And instead of having a five year term, we got it down to four years the first year, and now it's down to two year limit unless you're complying uh, with the uh, federal work requirements. State support for the University of California, down 25%. State support for Cal State, down 25%. These are real numbers. K through 12 education, we're about 9 billion below the funding level in 2007, eight. That's real dollars. So I run into people as I campaign around, they say you gotta cut more, but they don't have the faintest idea of the cuts that have already been made and they're serious, but we've got our fiscal house in order. Make no mistake about that. And the California dream is more vibrant than ever. In the last two years, over 300,000 new jobs created at a rate much higher than the rest of the nation. Personal income uh, has increased an average of 90 billion each of the last two years. We're now at 1.8 trillion. 
The first time I spoke at the Commonwealth Club back in 1975, the personal income of California was 139 billion. 139 billion to 1.8 trillion. These declinists, these dystopians, as I like to call them, who have this noir view of California, they're all wet. They don't know what the hell they're talking about. This is a vibrant, creative place, one of the most extraordinary pieces of real estate and collection of human beings in the whole world. Our exports are up 17% to $108 billion. Venture capital investment in California is half of what the rest of the country gets. And of course, we're leaning in the clean tech investment and the clean tech production. Patents are issued in California at four times the rate of the next state, which is New York. We have thousands of biotech companies that didn't even exist. I talked to Erwin Jacobs a few months ago, the founder of Qualcomm, a fantastic company. He told me that before the early 80s, not only did he not even conceive of the company, he could not even conceive of the products that are now being manufactured. The Mars rover is, was built in Pasadena, in Southern California, is being driven. I went there, saw the scientists, Chinese, Israeli, French, German, Indian, Russian, people from all over the world. They're still coming. The gold rush, they came from all over uh, the world too, to extract wealth from the ground, from the rivers, the mountains. Now people come here to extract wealth from the collective imagination of all those that are here. The, uh, the companies we got, I think back on Apple, when I was running for Secretary of State, there was no Apple. Now we got Apple, Quad, Qualcomm, Broadcom. Of course, we've had HP for a while, uh, but we have hundreds of these companies. It's among, California is up among the best, and we're the leading place for innovation and creativity in the world. But, and here's the big but, we don't stay on top by disinvesting in our schools, by disinvesting in our colleges and great University of California. The case for Proposition 30 is crystal clear. Invest in the California dream. Keep the creativity and the innovation alive and well and expanding and intensifying. Proposition 30 is very straightforward. It has two taxes. One is for four years, one is for seven years. The one for four years will cover all purchases except food and gasoline. It's one-fourth of a one percent. You buy something for four bucks, you pay a penny more. Buy two of it, you pay two pennies more. We can afford that. Now, the biggest bulk of the tax comes from the highest income earners. People, for the most part, filing as married couples who make over $500,000 a year. And now, let me do the math for you. If you're making that much money, you got at least 50,000 deductions. So let's say you make 600,000. You deduct 50,000, you got 550. You pay tax under Proposition 30 on the 50,000. That's 1%. That's 500 bucks. And then you deduct it on your federal, you're talking 350 bucks. That's what we're asking people. Now you make a million, you pay more, 7,500 bucks, and on it goes. But here we are in a time of need. Those who have done the best, can't they help us in California's time of need? And by the way, when I talk about the best, I just have a very powerful statistic. The top one percentile, uh, the top one percentile has increased, uh, has increased the, um, the, um, uh, their uh, growth in the share of income by 165%. The top 10%, this is, since, this is since the 80s. So in the 80s, the top 10% have increased their share of income by 78, 76%. The other 80% have either not increased at all or gone down 8% because there's been a redistribution from 80% of the people in California over 30 years to the top 20, more uh, specifically to the top 10, and to the top one. So looking back, to my seminary education, 
I refer to Saint, uh, Saint, uh, Saint Luke, who said in his gospel, chapter 12, verse 48, to those too much is given, much is required. We face not only a political question, not only an economic question, we face a moral question. Our society is held together by the contributions of all of us, all 38 million. We all do what we can. So each of us do what we can. And for those who have been most blessed, we're going to ask you for seven years, the biblical seven years. <laughs> Lean years, fat years. You've had them both. So now, as we face this difficult period ahead, I believe Proposition 30 comes at just the right time with just the right formula. That's the case for Prop 30. It's pretty simple. I can reduce it even more uh, summarily, and that is money into the schools and colleges into the California dream or out. In or out, yes or no, on or off. There's no middle way. Or if I could quote my Latin, tertium non datum, a third way is not given. <laughs> it's yes or no. In sum, we cleaned up a big budget mess, and now we have a structurally balanced budget for the first time in a decade. By California putting our fiscal house in order, we've up, been upgraded by the rating agencies. They're now saying we're uh, uh, positive. We've lowered our borrowing cost, and California's on the move again, adding jobs and investment in our state at a higher rate. We have to build for the future to ensure that growth. This means temporary revenue to invest in our schools. I was very impressed by the speech that Alexander Solzhenitsyn gave at Harvard many years ago. In that speech, he challenged all of us in the West. And he said that courage is the most important virtue, and it's a quality that I see declining throughout Western society. I want California to prove Solzhenitsyn wrong, that we have the courage to make cut, tough cuts, tough investment, a temporary tax, and pull together Republicans and Democrats, young and old, for this dream called California, alive today and alive for just as long as we believe in it and have the courage to make it real. Thank you. Thanks to California Governor Jerry Brown. Governor Brown, we have a large number of questions for you. Uh, many of them are uh, uh, serious questions about uh, Proposition 30. Let me ask you the uh, I'll paraphrase and bring some of them together. But one of them has to do with the fact that um, don't you really believe that once this occurs, once the Proposition 30 passes, that a large number of uh, the more wealthy people in this state will no longer be Californians? No, not at all. There's no empirical evidence to suggest that higher income people will move out of the state. There's a very careful study done when New Jersey raised its rates in comparison with New York, and very easy to move from that state to New York, and no empirical evidence demonstrates that. That is a canard. All right. The... Uh, Another question has to do with the fact that the, uh, the funds that are passed, uh, this, this questioner wants to know, will they really be going to students or are they going to go to teachers' pensions? They're going to go to the schools and the school districts so they can make the best decisions they can to finance our grossly underfunded public schools. That's what it is. And pensions is, is a piece of our challenge, just like all these other things, like our courts, like our mentally ill, like the disabled, like the criminals, like juvenile delinquents. We got a lot of issues, okay, and pensions is one of them. I've already taken the pension system back to where it was during the Reagan era, even before. Employees have to pay 50% now. Uh, 
the age is retired went from 50 to 57, 62 in the case of miscellaneous employees. And we're, we're making real progress. Uh, the teacher's retirement system is a different system, and it will take some additional funding. But that is not uh, comparable to what is needed to stop disinvesting in our kindergarten through 12 and our community colleges and our UC and Cal State system. That's a much larger uh, piece of investment in the 50 billion. Uh, the pension system uh, is much less than that, and I will have solutions for that uh, over the next year or two. Governor, some teachers have expressed concern in supporting Prop 30 because they worry that if the $6 billion goes to education, the legislature will cut back on its funding to, uh, to schools. So, wait, wait, that doesn't make sense. They're worried that, what, if it doesn't pass? They're worried, they're worried if, it do, if, if it, they're concerned that if it does pass. Yes. Okay. That in the $6 billion goes to education, but the legislature will cut back in its funding from the general fund to support education. No. The, the people have become very aware in this campaign how important education is. Uh, this goes into a special fund called the Education Protection Account, and all these tax dollars are going to our schools. And make no mistake about it, billions more will come into schools if Prop 30 passes than if it doesn't. What happens if... Uh, Proposition 30 does not pass, what's, what is the real impact on that going to be? The real impact is um, two to three weeks of kinder, uh, kindergarten through 12, thousands of fewer course offerings at community college, uh, serious increases in tuition, probably 2,000 at UC, uh, take longer to graduate. That's already automatically built into the budget. Now there are people wandering around who say, I don't want to pay that tax, and you can cut government more. Well. Uh, they're the same ones who say, you have more money. There are more cookies in that jar. Well, look, I've been in Sacramento for a long time, right? I was Secretary of State. I was governor a long time ago. I've been governor the last couple of years. I've spent an enormous amount of time going over this budget, and I know whereof I speak. Uh, if Proposition 30 loses, there's no more money. Do you, you want more felons in your neighborhood? Uh, do you think we can cut Medi-Cal more? There are 400 million dollars in cuts that Arnold made that have been held up in the Ninth, uh, District, uh, Ninth Court of Appeals. I'm still fighting those. On another case for cuts that haven't been realized yet, I'm in the U.S. Supreme Court. So that's not an avenue we can cut. How about the judges? They're already screaming bloody murder that they can't take any more cuts. I mean, personally, I think everybody can take some more cuts. I've only cut my office 25%. The rug's falling apart. I'm eating day-old tuna sandwiches, but <laughs> we're ready. But make no mistake about it. It's either A, the money's into the schools, or B, the money's out. Oh, there is a third alternative, which is not acceptable and will not be permitted as long as I'm governor. And that is to resort to budget maneuvers, accounting tricks, gimmicks, pretending revenue's coming in when it isn't, um, falsely stating you can make cuts that you know you can't based on past experience. That's called the gimmickry. That violates my first pledge. No more smoke and mirrors. Tell the truth. Level with people. So that option is off the table. Thank you. Recent polls suggest that there's a, the support for Proposition 30 is diminishing. How much does that concern you? Uh, th those little things don't concern me one bit. Um, the election concerns me, and I will work as hard as I can to the close of the polls on Tuesday night. This is too important. This is too transcendent for the well-being of California. So I will continue uh, to make my case for yes on Proposition 30. There are so many darn polls. Uh, if you read them carefully, uh, you will have the same sense of optimism that I do. The, uh, the uh, excuse me. Um, in addition to raising taxes on the wealthiest in the state, doesn't it really raise, raise taxes on everyone, including uh, an increase in gasoline taxes because no. of the sales tax? No, that, that's one of the clear lies of the No One Thirty campaign. You. There's no sales tax on gasoline. 
So can I use another Latin phrase? Falsio in unius, falsio in alterius. False in one, false in the other. That's my case against Proposition, uh, the, no, the no campaign. Um, secondly, this is actually significantly lower than taxes that were operative just 18 months ago. The tax structure used to be, under some temporary taxes, 14 billion higher than it is today, with a significantly higher car tax and a one cent sales tax, not a one quarter of 1%. That went away. And I would ask, how many people here knew that you've already enjoyed a 14% tax reduction? Raise your hands. I see, one, I see three hands. You must be close observers of the state budget. <laughs> so there were some temporary taxes. My first plan was to extend those for another four or five years. I needed a two-thirds vote. It was not forthcoming. I just couldn't get that number because I needed some Republican votes. And when it comes to a tax, asking a Republican to vote for a tax is asking, like asking the Pope to legalize birth control. You're not going there and nor are the Republicans. It's doctrinal. So we couldn't extend that tax. So we had to go out, I had to get the initiative. And so that's why we have the initiative today, but it's half. Remember, uh, it was just a few years ago that the legislature, the, the governor, got rid of the car tax. Something we uh, didn't get rid of it, but <clears throat> dramatically reduced it and gave a big loophole that is the subject of Prop 39. Those two actions alone cost the state about the same amount as Prop 30 will bring in if you vote yes on it, about $7 billion. So we're not adding. We're trying to uh, recapture what the state used to have just a couple of years ago. So there it is. Thank you. There's been considerable opposition to uh, uh, Prop 30 uh, with funding coming from outside California. Uh, coming from outside of California. Do you have any sense of where this is coming from and why? No. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I guess I shouldn't follow up on any discussion about a large amount of money coming from Arizona into the small business committee that in turn put a lot of money into Look, the... the committee is not small. It's questionable business at best, and the 11 million is the largest anonymous donation in the history of California. And in my legal considered judgment is illegal because it must be disclosed. What are you gonna do about that? The appropriate authorities, namely the FPPC and uh, the Attorney General uh, are in court as we speak. Okay, thank you. Is it, is it unfair to have uh... Uh, Prop 30 be retroactive to January 1 of 2012? No. Why? <laughs> it's constitutional, it's needed, and I think it's fair. We have to do our part in this time of need. California enjoys such a level of abundance that those of us who can give back what we have in abundance ourselves should be only too glad to do that. I'm very happy to say there are some substantial donors on the yes side that recognize uh, their obligation and their privilege to uh, pay more revenue into the state of California. If Prop 30 is enacted, what safety measures will be placed in, in order to make sure that there, there's good use and stewardship of the funds? The Education Protection Account, it's right in the ballot pamphlet. All the money has to go to the schools, the community colleges, and that will be audited and made public. Uh, you also mentioned public safety, and I want to um, take off from that term and mention the other aspect of Proposition 30, which is a separate constitutional amendment that guarantees the funding that the state transferred from state uh, funded programs to locally funded programs. Remember I said my third pledge was to bring government closer to the people. We've done that. It's called realignment. Public safety, mental health, uh, sheriffs, rehab, uh, drug treatment, uh, probation services, these are expensive in the billions. Last year, I, I signed a bill to 
uh, move those functions and the money down. That's a statute. It could be changed. And because it could be changed, uh, some of the local governments are hesitating to make the investment in uh, drug treatment programs or personnel that are needed to make uh, realignment uh, realize all the potential that it has. So by putting in a constitutional amendment as a second feature of Proposition 30, we guarantee that funding. That funding, by the way, is not anything to do with the tax from Prop 30. This is existing revenues that we've already devoted to local government for public safety. We just make sure that the legislature cannot reverse it. Thank you. For those of you who are listening on the radio, this is the Commonwealth Club of California, and our guest today is Governor Jerry Brown, who is speaking about his advocacy for Proposition 30 on the California ballot. Governor, this, uh, this question comes from someone in the audience who is opposing uh, Prop 30 because, in his or her view, it means tossing more money into a failed system. Why didn't you dedicate your time and effort to reform the system? I am reforming the system. It's called realignment. It's called welfare reform. It's called collapsing uh, various agencies. It's called uh, uh, putting some greater supervision over the court system. We have made substantial efforts at reform. It's called workers' compensation reform, a terrific reform that won the support of the Farm Bureau, the Chamber of Commerce, the AFL-CIO, the Teamsters, and a broad range of interests from the left to the right. It's also uh, called, well, it's realignment and it's workers' compensation. Those are all uh, very significant reforms. And when they talk about a failed system, remember, $90 billion on average the last two years added to the wealth of California. We have a fabulous state that we live in. Look all around the world, wherever you want to look. Look east, look west, and you're here in, in such a special place. And I know there's this meme. I have to use another term, M-E, M-E, meme. Go to Google if you don't know what it means. <laughs> these ideas, these fixed thoughts are circulating around about the failed system. You'll find it in some of these dystopian publications about a failed state. A failed state doesn't generate 300,000 new jobs. A failed state doesn't provide the home for Google and Qualcomm and Apple and all these other, uh, and the, all the new internet companies uh, coming along. Uh, a failed state doesn't get more patents than any other state, almost virtually more than the whole country combined. It, it doesn't get all the venture capital. There's more creative people in California than anywhere else in the world, and there's more finance capital to back up their great ideas. Government's not perfect. We got plenty of flaws. I know that. I was in a seminary for four years and I studied my flaws for <laughs> endlessly. And at the end of that period, I still had a hell of a lot of flaws. Okay, and we'll study California, we'll fix it. We're still gonna have flaws. To be human is to err. But California, in addition to erring, makes some fabulous decisions and our collective will as Californians, will not be slowed down by the skeptics, the declinists, or those fearful individuals who can't see where they are, the greatest place in the world. What's your, uh, what's your view about Prop 38? I'll leave that one to the voters. <laughs> okay. Uh, isn't Prop 38 uh, more fair because it increases taxes on everyone and asks everyone to share a common burden for the state to improve its educational system? Uh, given what has occurred over the last 30 years, no. I believe Proposition 30 is a fair distribution of the temporary tax burden. All right. Um, can you tell us about any conversations you had with Molly Munger regarding Prop 30 and Prop 38? No, I like to retain a certain level of confidentiality so that if you call me, you don't have to worry that you'll have to hear about it on the radio. 
Uh, <laughs> oh, one more point, because those numbers I mentioned before, I want to simplify it. Uh, the top 1% in the 70s took home about 10% of uh, the California income. Uh, recently, they're taking home over 22%. That, to me, is part of the case for the fairness of Proposition 30. Thank you. One more question here about... Uh, Prop 38. Uh, Prop 38 uh, requires funds to go directly to the school and the legislature can't touch it. Uh, is that quite so for Prop 30? Well, we have an education protection fund right in the law and every dollar from the taxes are going into that fund. By the way, just sending money to schools, rich and poor, might not make as much sense as having the school districts and their elected trustees figure out what's the best allocation. This question comes from someone who's been a California resident for a long time and has paid taxes for a long time. In fact, it's listed all, a variety of them. <laughs> but one thing that's happened over my years in California is that the tax rate keeps going up. Why should I have any confidence that Prop 30 will be temporary or that the taxes will just keep going up and up and up? He didn't have a lot of confidence because the temporary tax uh, signed by Arnold Schwarzenegger, twice as high as Prop 30, went out of existence. And the legislature was unable uh, to reverse that. It took an initiative sponsored by myself, and then it will depend on the vote of the people. So the people in California are in charge. All right. This questioner uh, is concerned that they... They appear to be being bullied and blackmailed into supporting Prop 30 because of the trigger cuts that would occur, but does not believe the trigger cuts are mandated. They're not automatic, and the legislature can choose other options if Prop 30 fails. Uh, they are automatic. That's another piece of total misinformation um, among the various other mistaken notions. The cuts are in the budget, the law of California. They cannot be changed unless the legislature wants to reverse it and the governor signs the bill and I won't sign the bill. So they are, you can take that to the bank. It's there and that's number one. Number two, there isn't any more money. How much further can we go in reducing our prisons? How much more can we empty our courts? How much more can we fight through the federal courts to try to cut Medi-Cal? There's no more redevelopment to cut. So the truth is, and I've looked at it, I'm not a guy who just showed up in Sacramento last week. I devoted virtually my whole life to various governing structures in California. I'm telling you, the money's not there unless Proposition 30 makes it there. That's, and you might say, well, why? Why were taxes lower? Well, I'll give you two reasons. When I was governor the first time, the prison system cost 3% of the general fund. Two years ago, before I was governor, it went to 11.5%. 11.5%, you figure that out on a $90 billion budget. It's more than the taxes I'm asking for. Number two, Medi-Cal spending, aging population. Guess what? We're getting older. A lot of people become infirm. They got to be taken care of. Medi-Cal spending has risen. You take Medi-Cal, aging of our population, you take the number of people in prison, and that'll just about equal the difference in taxation today uh, from what it was 30 years ago. We're starting to wander out of direct questions concerning Prop 30, but there are several related ones. In the face of the severe cuts to education funding, how do you rationalize the commitment to the billions going to a high-speed rail system? How does the federal government rationalize spending two and a half billion dollars to put a one-ton truck on Mars when it's 1.4 trillion in debt every year? How do we rationalize any of the broad range of activities that make California and our country what it is? We have to invest. And if we want to just build more freeways to accommodate the 20 million people coming or expand the airports, good luck. It'll cost more if it can even happen. So there has to be an alternative. It's worked in 16 countries. It'll work here. Right. 
What are the chances for meaningful prison reform, especially in light of the strength of the prison, prison uh, workers' unions? Uh, prison, the correctional officers have been very uh, vital players in helping us uh, bring our budget into line. Uh, that's number one. Number two, we've had significant uh, prison reform uh, through the realignment process. The non so-called, I want to say so-called, the less serious, the nonviolent, and other categories that we feel are appropriate for local supervision have been transferred uh, to the local level, and that's part of why Prop 30 has a constitutional provision to protect the funding to make it work. So we've had significant uh, prison and correctional reform. Should we go further? Yes. And that will certainly be on my agenda in the coming years. There have been a variety of cuts to California's public higher education system over the past several years, but it's still a relatively cheap system of higher education for students. Shouldn't we expect our students to provide more in the way of tuition? No. And I'll tell you why. Uh, student debt now is growing faster than mortgage debt and credit card debt. It's about a trillion dollars. We have uh, grandparents who co-signed on their children, and now they're uh, stressed, many of them. This is a national challenge. We have to find more money for our higher education. How was it that when my mother went to University of California at Berkeley, she paid $26 a semester? When I went, almost 30 years later, I paid about $125 a semester. Now, more in the neighborhood of 12000 There are a lot of reasons for that. I've detailed all the cuts we've made, the 23% uh, fall in our general fund, the greatest recession since the Great Depression. Uh, the roller coaster boom and bust, where you spend too much in the boom and then the money isn't there and you're still obligated. Uh, lo lots of reasons. Oh, and the elimination of the car tax. That costs us $6 billion. Single sales factor, another billion. All these uh, changes have intensified the pressure on spending. And tragically, when you look around to reduce the budget, higher education is exposed. It is not protected uh, by the federal regulatory framework such as um, uh, Medi-Cal and other human services. Uh, it doesn't have quite the same uh, immediate impacts uh, of closing courts or um, eliminating prisons. So uh, we're in a constrained world of, of funding with uh, sharply increased need. And uh, I try to make the best judgment we can. And I would think going forward, um, we ought to make the university live as tightly as it can so that students can afford to get their four-year education and get it in four years. Okay, thank you. We're wandering afield now with other issues facing California. Yeah, don't, hey, don't get off message. Okay, well, <laughs> I'd like to, but, but your short, quick answers are uh, answering just about every question that's come, come forward. Would you like to add anything to the message? No. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks for the help. Look, Proposition 30 is money into the schools and colleges or money out. It's fair, it's moral, it represents the best in our California tradition, and it is critical to maintaining the California dream. Okay. I am wandering a little afield, sorry. Um, the lack of oversight for the public utilities in California is an embarrassment and a disgrace. The Bay Area's example of this is the record of PG&E and its disregard for public safety. The Public Utilities Commission is almost an extension of the public utilities instead of providing oversight. How can you reform this? I, I don't agree with that premise. We have very zealous and knowledgeable regulators on the PUC. The fact that you have a problem may create a good news story, but it shouldn't be unexpected. We are human beings. Things happen, and then we respond. The Public Utilities Commission has a very important task. A very complex industries are under its supervision, and I think it's doing a very credible job. Okay. 
Back to Prop 30. This question, there is a question that states that if Prop 30 passes, it's really just going to hurt small businesses and kill jobs in the state. It's not true. It's not true. We're creating businesses. Uh, did, were these same critics around when um, Arnold Schwarzenegger and the legislature enacted taxes that are twice as high as the ones I'm proposing? They were pretty silent. So I, I think that their claim is, is not well founded. And I also think that uh, it's pretty clear that uh, you have to get to over 500,000 before you pay uh, your first 1%. Pay 1% to you get to uh, 750,000. Uh, I'd say that'll cover most businesses. And quite frankly, we have to invest in our colleges, in our kids, in our future, in our brain power. This is wealth, but it's collective wealth. But it, we all enjoy it. We all tap into it. It's not all me, me, and myself. It's us together, a community, a society. That's really the whole issue in this whole campaign. For those of you on the radio audience, you're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California, and our guest today is California Governor Jerry Brown, who is speaking about his advocacy for Proposition 30 on the California ballot. It seems as if the uh, proposition system has really gotten out of hand with the total number of propositions on the ballot. Has, this pro has the proposition system in California start to fail because the legislature does not really do what it's supposed to do? That's, you've got two points there. The uh, activity of the California legislature and the role of the initiative process. Uh, I would say the initiative definitely has been captured uh, by people of great wealth. Uh, that's true. Uh, but that's part of the Citizens United progeny uh, wherein the court equates spending money hundreds of millions of dollars of money from whatever source as a form of talking. And talking and speech is protected by the First Amendment by a five to four vote. Uh, so uh, that's in the structure of, of things. I think we combat, as Justice Holmes said, um, speech with more speech. So that's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to have more speech. And when you have a ballot measure, uh, thank God uh, for the fact that we have uh, individuals who step up to the plate, and we have organization called unions who collect dues and can counterbalance the enormous power and money on the other side. Second point you want to know about the legislature. The legislature uh, hasn't enjoyed, you know, widespread popular support. <laughs> you laugh. But the legislature in many ways reflects the diversity of California. When things were localized, when the folks in Modoc County got to shape their own destiny, they pretty well figured out how to agree. Same is true of San Francisco or Berkeley or Orange County. When you centralize things, uh, decision-making, flow of money, as occurred after Proposition 13, uh, you bring everybody together to make common decisions for the state. Like it or not, Modocians think differently than San Franciscans. When you get them all in the same room and you add in Tolarians and Fresnoans and uh, Los Angelinos, it gets difficult to arrive at consensus. But don't look just to the California legislature, look to the Congress. They're having a hard time agreeing. There is a certain regime crisis facing not only America, but I even extend it uh, to Europe. How do we find uh, the common pathway when people are so, so deeply divided? And when we say they're divided, people are seeing different realities. So people say, you haven't cut enough. We don't like those taxes because it'll drive business away. Uh, other people say, no, we need more money. We need even more tax money into our universities. Very different uh, perspectives. By the way, I have to say, back in 1980, there was a business executive who said, because of my policies as governor, California would stop growing. 139 to 1.8 trillion sounds pretty good growth to me. Most people in the world would be envious to have an opportunity to benefit from that. So 
The legislature reflects the divisions. It is a struggle. There are lobbyists. Uh, people are worried about what will happen to their business or their identity, the things they believe in. So they're all up there. That's democracy. It can be messy at times. Go back and read what Adams said about Jefferson. Read what, how, how Aaron Burr treated Hamilton. I mean, it was rough. Um, at least we don't have duels anymore. <laughs> so look, don't give up on democracy because at the heart of democracy is the political process. We have a representative government. So you have to send people who, to represent you. But they don't, up there, they don't represent just you. They have all these different points of view up there. And so that's why you get this, uh, this um, strange sausage called legislation. That's why they say don't try to probe into too deeply how it's made. But somehow it's worked. <laughs> it's worked for a long time. I mean, we've come a long way. Believe me, the first governor of California, Peter Burnett, in his second state of the state speech called for the extermination of the native peoples. Yes, he did. And the legislature promptly passed a bond issue to pay for their scalps. We've made some progress. <laughs> I mean, I, I like to draw that demarcation. I mean, <laughs> Barnett to Brown. I mean, you know, it's, that's progress. <laughs> Burnett, actually. A large amount of money was discovered tucked away in a special account for the California State Parks Commission. Could there be another 40 or $50 million tucked away someplace else in some other department that could help ease this crisis? And if there were 20, 30 billion versus 6 billion, you do the arithmetic. Uh, we are facing a, a serious gap in our commitment to public education. And that's why we need Proposition 30. And as far as the park money, you know why uh, some uh, individuals in the Parks Department got away with not spending money? Because no one ever imagined that people in state government wouldn't spend money. All they get their hands on. All the controls are to curb uh, overspending and misspending. They didn't have curbs for making sure you get the money out the door. Well, well, we'll correct that. But by the way, thank God the money's still there because now we're spending it, opening the parks. By the way, people say that's a good reason to shorten the school year by three weeks. Why is that a good reason? The people who did it aren't in the parks anymore. I mean, the, the, the logic, it's, it's, it's a feeling here. Okay, you had a little problem in parks. And what do you know about that? Well, we got over well over 300,000 employees. And why can't you control everybody? Well, if I can refer to my seminary training, even God doesn't control everybody. There's something called freedom of the will, and you can actually sin. Well, if God can't control you, how the hell can I? There's a, there's a Governor, there's a good deal of cynicism sitting in this audience today, and it keeps popping up in questions. Let me read this one to you. Um, the people supporting Prop 30 are the politicians who continue to spend more money than the state has. Prop 30 rewards this dangerous behavior by giving them billions of dollars more to spend with no reforms and no guarantees the money won't be wasted or that it will really get into the classrooms. Well, there's another ill... Um, you know, what shall I say? I'll choose my words. Ill-conceived or ill-thought-out. Uh, there has been reforms. Uh, money, I think, is increasingly being spent well. Wherever you can find a cut, I'll make it. I I'm not a big spender. I don't like to spend. You know, I was born in 1938. We had rationing during World War II. You know, my mother bought a leg of lamb the last four days, five days maybe. I mean, I I'm not into spending. I'll spend what I need if it can invent something wonderful and beautiful and be part of our, our future, whether it's schools or education or uh, some form of transportation or alternative energy or reliable water. Sure, planting trees. Uh, yeah, I want all that stuff. But uh, waste and doing stupid things, wherever I can ferret it out, I will. 
So I think, and by the way, this term of opprobrium called politician. Um, now, I'm not going to give a defense of politicians. I'm not that stupid. Um, <clears throat> but I will say uh, the word politician comes from politeia, which means the, the polis, the community, um, the city-state uh, in ancient Greece. The politician, unfortunately, has the work of trying to mesh all these totally discordant, contradictory opinions and identities, and they clash. And that's why sometimes people get a little tired of democracy and representative democracy, because it is strenuous. And it does take sustained courage to keep at it, even when you see things you don't like or you get disappointed. Now, if I were going to be cynical or get disappointed, I would have checked out a long time ago. But I've come back. I've come back when I could be doing other things. Because I really believe in California. I think my family's made a contribution to make the state better. And as long as I've got the brains and the energy, I'm going to keep working for California because I believe in it. As we speak, I keep getting more questions coming from the audience, adding to this hundred or so that are here. One of them, uh, uh, the, the keep, uh, this question keeps harking back to uh, an issue you, you uh, touched on before, but I think you probably should review it again. The Wall Street Journal identified a flaw that the governor of, this, of California is trying to sell his tax hike to voters this November by saying it will go to the schools. The dirty little secret is that the new revenue is needed to backfill the insolvent teacher's pension fund. Uh, that's not true. As a matter of fact, we're not paying the teacher's pension fund except by the statutory amount that hasn't changed in a number of years. So that's part of the uh, dystopian thinking that government is all about pensions. Government is about a lot of things. And we uh, align things based on our best lights. When pensions were increased <clears throat> under the famous SB 400 that uh, became <clears throat> unsustainable, <clears throat> almost no Republican voted no. In fact, they all voted, almost all of them voted yes. That was the thought at the time. Because the boom, the mortgage, money, the housing, the construction, all that. Then it collapsed. We didn't have the money. Uh-oh, uh now the pensions don't look sustainable. So we correct. And we're correcting now. We have cities correcting. San Jose, <clears throat> San Diego, Stockton, other, other uh, local uh, jurisdictions. They're struggling in their own way to right the ship of, of state as they see it in their local community. And uh, we, will, we will evolve. This, it's very easy for people to sit on the side and point, say, oh, there's, there's something wrong there. There's a flaw. Well, yeah, there are always going to be flaws because we're human. But as we see the problems, we correct. And I have examined uh, some of the commentary from that particular journal journalistic source. And I'm not impressed uh, by their uh, accuracy uh, or by their uh, optimism. Uh, it seems a little bit um, narrow as the way they view things. <clears throat> In the midst of this, I found one question that made me smile. Um, this person states that uh, Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom says that you waited too long to campaign for this proposition. Since he has nothing to do, <laughs> why haven't you asked him to go out on the stump more? Uh, I think that's one of those questions that answers itself. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, uh, Dan Walters, the columnist of the Sacramento Bee, recently said that California is dysfunctional and structurally ungovernable, and he's calling for a constitutional convention. What do you think of that? Well, if things are so dysfunctional, what makes him think that a constitutional convention would be any different? <laughs> Would any Californians be invited? <laughs> and would they represent any of the interests that are now represented in Sacramento? 
What happens within the state if Prop 30 fails and Prop 38 is successful? Six billion dollars in trigger cuts, um, and more money, but channeled in in some rather complicated and burdensome ways. And of course, the legislature would figure out probably how to deal with it. But I don't recommend it because I'm here to make the case for Proposition 30, and to me, it's clear and persuasive. Okay, thank you. Governor Schwarzenegger thought it was a good idea to sell some of our major buildings and then lease them back for 30 years. What do you think of that idea? I canceled it. I canceled the sale. It was a bad idea. It's basically a loan at an interest rate of 10%. So you know, borrow money, borrow it fair and square. Put a, put a bond out for the people to vote on it. All right, thank you, Governor. Uh, for those of you in the radio audience, this is the Commonwealth Club of California, and our guest today is California Governor Jerry Brown, who is speaking about his advocacy for Proposition 30 on the California ballot. Governor Brown, we have time for only a couple of more questions, but before I ask those, I'd like to ask you if you'd like to make any major summation about Prop 30 one more time. When I was elected, I found a budget mess We've cleaned up that budget mess. We have a structurally balanced budget. We're going to do it with either cuts or we're going to do it with money into the schools from Proposition 30. We can afford it. In fact, we can afford no less. Because what's at stake is our future, the kids, the university, the life of the mind, the leading edge companies that California represents. It, to me, I've studied a lot. Proposition 30 is the right response for the problems we now face today. Thank you. We have uh, time for uh, just two more questions. Um, when you were running for re-election, uh, you were occasionally asked whether or not you were using this run for the gubernatorial position as a stepping stone to something larger, perhaps a presidential rate. And to paraphrase your response, you quite often said that if you look at the actuarial tables and what will happen after I've served eight years as governor, probably I won't be in a condition to run for president. <laughs> However, after you examine the age and condition of some of our United States senators, <laughs> would you not consider a run for the Senate? I don't think so. OK. I don't mind flying on Southwest, but there's longer flights every couple of weeks. Left. Besides that, I don't think we need to speculate on what's going to happen down the road here. We have a lot on our plate right now, and that I can respond to. But for the future, uh, you'll just have to guess. I have run for a lot of offices. <laughs> Last question. Would I blame my father for that. He, <laughs> I didn't realize it. But I was born in 1938. My father ran for district attorney in 1938 and lost. He then ran again in 1943, and he won. I was in kindergarten at the time. Then two years later, he ran for attorney general and lost. And then he ran for re-election as DA and won. And then, a year, then two years later, he ran for attorney general and won. And then in 1952, he ran as the favorite son of the presidential ticket. And then he ran for... Um, uh, re-election as attorney general in 54, and then in 58 he ran for governor, and then, and then and all the way up to 66, and then he retired uh, with the help of Ronald Reagan in 1966, and then I ran for the junior college board in 69, then I ran for secretary of state in 70, <laughs> then I ran for governor in 74, then I ran for president in 76, I ran for re-election in 78, ran for president in 1980, ran for senate in 19... Uh, 82, finally, whew, I took a little breather and came back and became the party chair, then run for mayor, and then for attorney general, here I am as governor. Do I have more offices in mind? <laughs> I'm not telling. I think we'll, uh, I think we'll leave it to that. Uh, our thanks to California Governor Jerry Brown. We also thank our audiences here and on the radio, television, and the internet. 
Uh, we also want to remind everyone in the room to please remain seated until Governor Brown has left the room. I'm Joseph Fink, the President Emeritus of Dominican University, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned.